Can I get that on tape too? <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Shoot you somewhere. <laughs> So after they worked on your burns, they figured out you had a fractured fibula? Yeah, well, well that was about, uh, I guess, two weeks after I'd been in the hospital that, mm -hmm. for two weeks. And then they said it? No, they didn't do it. He says, it's already healing up and we're not going to touch it now. Okay. So nothing was ever done with that. Okay. And I had it uh, uh, x-rayed up here last time I went to the VA hospital there, and they said, it looks all right, it's mm -hmm. doing good. Mm -hmm. But my, my foot is different than the other one. Though. So you were there <coughs> six or seven weeks? Six, seven weeks in the hospital there. Mm -hmm. And that was March, so it would have been late April? Somewhere along there that, uh, that I went there was uh, shipped into Oakland Naval Hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, they didn't do much uh, treatment of anything for me there. I was uh, physically eagle on the outside. And uh, they didn't, uh, they, it was, that was the best place to be. I mean, they had big cylinders of pure cream and milk. They fed you like you were, they were on your deathbed there. <laughs> they can feed you to death. But uh, that was a beautiful hospital, and I was treated real well there. Well, there was one anecdote there was I, I went into the hospital that, when I first was uh, taken off the plane and carried an ambulance over there and, and uh, put in a bunk. Uh, I was just getting stretched out and trying to go to sleep. And this fellow touched me on my bunk. And he says, do you mind if I play some Spanish records? And all I could think of being a musician was La Paloma and that's the Spanish music, you know. And, but that wasn't what he was doing there. I leaned over and went to sleep again, tried to go to sleep there. And I heard the old record player go, rah, 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 Los Huevos. Los Huevos. And then he would say, Los Huevos. <laughs> that means egg, I think. <laughs> Anyhow, that, uh, that was a funny thing in there. But Anyhow, I got in there and, and uh, uh, they said, 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 uh, they uh, and uh, then would be discharged from there. And uh, I was treated well. I received my medals and awards and everything there. And the captain uh, of the Naval Hospital was a real nice gentleman there. I was treated really nice. And, uh, and they had German prisoners all out there doing, doing work in the yard and all. What but, was uh, your um, what was your uh, what was your thoughts as you left Peleliu for the last time on your way back to the states? Well, I <coughs> didn't have much thoughts on it. Uh, <coughs> I boarded a one of those uh, what you call a commando. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the designation of the plane, and uh, I had carried my suitcase in one hand with my crutches and all going, and got was able to get in the plane. They helped me in the plane. First thing I did was stretch out in the back of the plane on the tie-down ropes and got hold of a ring in each hand and went to sleep back there. And I thought, boy, here I go. That was it. And so we landed in uh, Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was going to bring some souvenirs back. Everybody was offering me all kinds of souvenirs, uh, grand rifles and, and uh, big, uh, the, uh, automatic rifles, uh, bombing automatic and stuff like that, and an uh, eight-day clock. But I've been told that if you had anything like that, they're going to take it away from me when you get there. And besides that, I couldn't carry it. So I just, uh, with uh, do all that, they gave me pictures. Everybody wanted to come out and give me squadron pictures, little uh, bantam camera pictures that they had, and one thing and another, which I brought back with me. But I went there and spent the night there and, and uh, got a good feed of Hawaiian pineapple and got up the next morning and we got on a, a four-engine plane, I don't remember the designation of it right now, and started back to the States. And as uh, we got about I don't know, 250 miles out or something like that, we lost two engines and had to come back and get another plane and then flew on into Oakland. And uh, 
from there, like I said, went on to Jacksonville Naval Hospital. And then you, and did, were, did you ever have any thoughts about staying in the Marines? I, I'd, uh, yes, that's the reason I got out of the hospital there. The commanding officer came by on an inspection morning, and uh, I think it was Saturday morning, and said, well, Lieutenant, how are you doing? I said, well, I'm doing pretty good, but I'd sure like to get out of here and join my squadron. I didn't realize the squadron had already been dismantled. But uh, he said, oh, you want to get out? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, so you can get out if you want to. I was going to give you a medical discharge. So <laughs> that was the last of my discharge and my medical discharge. <laughs> so I said, no, I'll get out. And uh, and so he said, okay, you can check out anytime you want. So I grabbed all my bags and started out. And, and uh, I was sent down to the Marine detachment because I was a Marine and uh, checked in there got my room, and immediately went down to the flight line. I had about three or four days left before I could make up all my back flight pay. And even though I was just out of the hospital, I went down, I checked out a Corsair. I talked to the, uh, the flight man down there at the, on the flight line. And uh, he sa I told him my situation. I was going to lose six months flight pay unless I could make the time up uh, in about four or five days. And uh, he said, well, we got a Corsair over there. They just uh, changed the tail wheel on it. If you go on over and get that, you can, you can fly that. They go, or no, they just changed the engine on it. They, you can put engine time on it, which is low and slow. So I uh, went over and checked out a parachute and got me some new flight gear because I didn't have any flight gear then. And uh, went uh, down to the plane where it was sitting in the edge of a hangar. And just as I got there, the tail wheel collapsed on the cotton picker. And uh, so I went back to him and he said, well, wait just a minute, it'll be ready for you there. So I waited a while and then they signaled up that it was ready. So I went down and got in that course there. And I hadn't been in the course there for six months there. So I taxied out uh, to the end of the runway and magged up my engines. Everything was great. Lined up down the runway, hit the throttles, and got it all uh, tuned up and, and crew down there and started taking off, raising my wheels, raising my flaps. And it felt like I'd never been out of the cockpit. So you don't lose that real fast. Mm -hmm. And I flew around up there for until the gasoline almost ran out and came in. And then uh, next time I got a SNJ to fly, there was a uh, Army plane went down in Georgia, and they wanted me to go out and scout around and see if I could find any evidence where there'd been a wreck out there. They gave me a Navy dentist for a backseat observer, and uh, we flew and flew and flew, but we never found anything. And finally came back, and uh, I got my flight time, made all up, and that was, that was a real relief there. And then I was. Go ahead. And then I was uh, 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 ordered up to, uh, again, Carolina's the Cherry Point, Cherry Point to the uh, Marine Corps Air Station there. <coughs> and I uh, checked in with a major, and, and uh, they had me behind a huge desk with uh, enlisted men's service record books stacked up three feet high all around it. And all I did was sign those things, I think, 14 times in each one. and and uh, and uh, put it away and sign it again. I got where I couldn't even write. All I could do is eat the scribble, you know. So I went in to see the major, and I said, look, uh, I'm an aviator. I'm not used to this kind of stuff, and I'd like to uh, get back in flying if I can, and uh, I need to have some, some air time. And he said, well, just keep it up a little bit, and I'm going to see what I can find for you. Well, I did it a couple more days, and signing those discharge books. And I was getting cramps about it. I couldn't even write. I still can't write to this day. And uh, we, uh, he came in one day there and says, uh, I'm going to give you orders now. You're going out to St. Simon's Island, Georgia. There's a CIC school out there, and you can go through the CIC school. So I went out there, and, and uh, I, the only flying I got there was flying an SNB in for them to do radar runs on me. CIC was? Combat Intelligence Center. 
And this that's the whole heart of a ship, the combat intelligence. Center. That's where that big plastic board is, mm -hmm. and they have the azimuth on it there, mm -hmm. and they chart chart or put little directions for every ship that's in their particular mm -hmm. squadron or fleet is on that, and then the radar, uh, the uh, radar the operators, they come, they radio in every time they see a blip in the air or anything, any bogey or anything, and it's listed either a bogey or it's identified. And it, it, was, a, it was a first class school. I mean, it was nice. And I was halfway through that, and they posted the bullets on a board out in the front. And I dropped by and took a look at my bullet where I was going. And I was going to be fighting a director officer, officer on, a, on a destroyer in the Pacific Fleet. And I said, hey, man, I can't stand that. <laughs> I don't think I could run my little ship like that. I'd be seasick for the rest of my life. And so, and so they, I asked them if I could just have a discharge. And they said, yep. So I was discharged there. And uh, I went down, I went home. And then went to, I met Francis down there. And, How'd you meet? I met Francis when I was in the torpedo bomber school down there. We were out on the beach one day. There's, I think, four or five of us uh, pilots uh, on bicycles and rode out to the beach. And someone threw a ball over there from her direction. I picked it up and took it over and gave it back to her and introduced myself. And that began the whole thing. And I invited her to go to church with me on Sunday morning, which we did. And somebody introduced us as Lieutenant Mrs. Brown. <laughs> Dad fixed us up. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a great time ever since. And um, so you came back uh, from from uh, the Marines, and mm -hmm. shortly after you got shortly back, shortly after you got that, married. we were married. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And been happy ever since. Okay, Um We've had an opportunity to interview Walt, uh, Major Walter Meyer, and we, mm -hmm. our, my sense is that Squadron thinks the world of him. What, what, are, what's, what is your impression of, of Major Meyer and the job he did and, uh, <coughs> in terms of running Squadron and just uh, working uh, under his command? Well, I, I got along with him good, and I thought he was a top-notch commanding officer. I would have followed him anywhere. He was an excellent aviator, and uh, he just, just was, I don't think he could have found a better man. Mm -hmm. And they had a lot of good people out there doing that, mm -hmm. and that's the reason he selected him for those jobs. You know, we, we've uh, heard stories that uh, he played a large role in getting that uh, PBY to land. Uh, I, of course, didn't. You wouldn't have known. I, I wasn't privy to the conversations going on at that time there, but I'm sure he was uh, very insistent on it there, <laughs> picking me up there. Have you heard anything about what he might have said? Uh, I wouldn't repeat it. <laughs> hey, I think he would deny it. If he it was, uh, absolutely denies saying anything. Uh, uh, That's uh. actually not 100% true. He said something to us to confirm that indeed he said something to encourage the PBY to land. Oh, yes. He yeah. said he would not repeat what it was, and he didn't think it was quite as colorful as had been reported. Well, see, I was unable to do hear that conversation where I was down there, but I've been told those stories too, though, and, and I'm sure he did. Uh, I heard that uh, he said, either you come in or we're going to shoot you down. I don't know if it's in those straight terms or not, but... But uh, he made business. He was a he was a cracker jack flyer, and he I think he loved his men, and, and he was going to take care of them. We heard from uh, a uh, aviator from VMF 122 that 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 was almost his exact words mm -hmm. yesterday uh -huh. when we were there. So there's mm -hmm. some some support for uh -huh. that notion. <laughs> well, I'm gonna say I didn't hear it, so. I'm just repeating what, mm -hmm. what someone else told me. Mm -hmm. <coughs> How was he as a uh, military officer? I mean, was he pretty uh, strict, or how, how did he run his uh, squadron? Well, I thought he ran, ran his squadron uh, as a real, uh, I mean, an expert, what I would call him. He was an expert squadron commander. Mm -hmm. uh, I know they had a lot of good people in there. I think Marine Corps was full of them. Mm -hmm. 
But I'll set him out there as, as a commanding officer of a squadron any time there. He was, uh, he's just, uh, just always nice. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess maybe some, some big would have uh, differences of opinion there, but to me he was a, a, a really uh, a fine, that, fine man yeah. and a fine officer. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Oh. Oh. <laughs> May I? Yeah. Did I take the cover off? Go ahead. So could you explain to us what this is? That's the cockpit control for the rudder trim tab. And it sits right up in the top. You got, you got the uh, elevator trim tab and the ailerons trim tab. And this one sat right up in the corner up here. And if you if you don't have your rudder trimmed just right, you'll be in a skid. So that's what I was reaching for to adjust this trim tab here. It had a another top on it there, and you adjust that, and that's back on the rudder, a little panel back on the rudder that goes back and forth, and that kicks your rudder back into the wind to make you be going straight. So it's a uh, and that's the same way with the elevator trim tab. You try to uh, trim that up so that your plane doesn't go up or doesn't go down and it flies <coughs> straight and level. The, the aileron trim tab is the one out on the end of your wings on your aileron. And that you trim to where the wings <coughs> are level. Pat, and, can you uh, hold that in a position about, and have Pat hold it about where that would have been in the cockpit? Well, in if the direction it was faced? I'm, I'm sitting right here and it was right up here. And where did this trim tab come from? That came from a friend of mine <laughs> <laughs> who picked it up in, in the on the on Bible thought. I run this on no, it's on Coro. On Coro, that's okay. On, on Coro in the Palau Islands, it's from the <coughs> from my airplane, which we had studied and determined to be sure it was the right plane. When I was shot out, this plane landed in the mangroves on Coro. And, uh, what's your name? Pat. <laughs> Pat Scanlon Scan, uh, came one day and uh, brought pictures and another thing and, uh, and came back on several occasions there. And on the last occasion, they brought this uh, trim tab in to me there. And I was really grateful to have something like that. They also said they found a hammer in the cockpit there. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know that uh, I, I accused my plane captain there of putting that in there, and, and uh, that's what hit me in the head instead of the shrapnel. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's all in fun. Thank you very much. But that this this you have to trim your plane straight. You can bear in mind that if it's in a skid, the plane can be pointed this way, and you're going this way. And your guns would be shooting over here instead of where you're going. So it all, it's all the trim tab has to be trimmed up just right. And the attitude of the plane, that's what, what it is, the attitude. Uh, so that you're not slipping, sliding, or climbing, or diving, or anything like that. Well, let's stand up and let me shake your hand, Brownie, because it's a real pleasure. Oh, man. It's a real pleasure to know you. Yeah. Well, it's a pleasure to know you over these past years. Eh? It's been really nice having you come visit us. And Thank you. You're welcome any time in the Brown household here, so Thank you. we'll put you on the list. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice to have met y'all. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Let me take this off. Yeah.
disabled, and, and he was able to land on Babel Top. You know whereabouts, sir? I, it's up in the, uh, it's up in this area right here somewhere. Near a lighthouse? No, he wasn't by the lighthouse. The lighthouse is Major Meyer bombed that lighthouse. I'd say it was right up in, right in here somewhere. Is that, uh, is it on here? Perry, yeah, Virginia's Perry. Will it be in the uh, war diary? Yeah, right, right in there. In the war diary? When he was shot down, yeah. What's your recollection of what occurred? What occurred? I don't know what occurred. I wasn't, uh, I didn't even on that place at all. I don't know whether he was up there uh, with the two man. You fly sometimes two man patrols, sometimes four man, the whole uh, division, and uh, never by yourself. But they, he was, uh, I think they were up there looking for targets. But they put a bullet through his engine there, and his engine conked out, and he was able to, to uh, land there without being hurt. And the story I heard is he. He uh, jumped out of his plane and ran to the tree and wooded area over this way. And uh, then the next, this this is uh, <coughs> once you this story. I told a story about the uh, native that that uh, told the story of him. That's all I know. The Japanese caught him, and they marched him. They took a put a rope around his neck, and they marched him through the native places there, and said, "This is the enemy. When you see him, kill him." Took him back to the Japanese headquarters, cut his head off, 